welcome to the Cursed Kingdom. It's week five of this curse, and it looks like nothing's going to change any time soon. There's no way out. No light at the end of the tunnel. And so, despite the depressing, tragic events of this land, let us welcome our guest for today, Gerald Dean Rice. Hello, Gerald. I hope you didn't find it too much trouble trying to enter these forsaken lands, and I hope you didn't have too many trials to face. Not a problem at all. Got a little bit lost, but, you know, there was a troll that kind of pointed me in the right direction. Oh, the trolls were nice today. That must be in a very good mood. It's unusual. Yeah. So... Let's start with the basics then. Who are you and what do you do? Well, uh, my name is Gerald Dean Rice. Uh, I am a horror author, uh, reader, watcher, pretty much anything horror I'm into. I uh, have been since I was a little kid. So you're pretty much in the ideal place then. <laughs> Just try not to lose any fingers or toes. We don't have insurance. Right. <laughs> so you mentioned to me that you'd written a book. Could you tell us a little yes, bit about it? I published a. Uh, absolutely. I published a novella earlier this year called Part Time Zombie. Uh, it's about, um, well, essentially a, a woman who finds out that she's technically not alive uh, she, while she's in between jobs working part time for a doctor. She also realizes she has a hunger for human flesh. Oh, that that must be awkward, working for a doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of hard to, uh, you know, find a job when you are in that situation. I guess she could always be like um, Liv Moore from I Zombie, become a mortician. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So. What other books have you published? Because I believe you said that you'd published a few or written a few. Am I yeah, wrong in saying that? Yeah, I actually that? have. Yeah, I, I actually have. Uh, my uh, my first novel was published in 2010 by Severed Press, uh, a book called uh, The Ghost Toucher. And I, uh, since then, have had uh, some other books or short stories or novella published uh in the in, in the zombie vein it was uh flesh bags or um oh shoot i'm forgetting my own titles oh i i had a, i had a, a novel published by a division of amazon in 2016 called dead till dawn and uh yeah i've written other stuff other than zombies but i my brother pointed out to me one once it's like hey you write about zombies a lot and my knee-jerk reaction was to say, no, I don't. <laughs> but I thought about it for a second. I was like, oh, I, I guess I do. But that's probably because zombies are awesome. You can't go wrong with a good zombie story. You really can't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, it was more of a subconscious thing. I, I didn't set out to do it intentionally, but, you know, I, I had to recognize it. Oh, yeah, that, that is pretty much what I've been doing a lot. <laughs> So, do you write any other genre, or just fan, uh, just horror? Um, I do like other genres. I, I, I've actually just recently, in the last, I'd say, two years, gotten into Bizarro. I mean, I'd, I'd heard people talking about it, and, I, and finally, I broke down and, and asked, "Hey, what, what is this?" Or you know, started doing research on my own, and it's like, okay, well, I want to read one of these and see what it's about. And uh, I, I asked, hey, look, what's a, what's a, I've never read it before. What's a good place to start? And uh, someone suggested getting a short called David Bowie is Trying to Kill Me. And I read it. It was strange. And it was, it was excellent. I loved it. Uh, and, and after then, it was like, okay, you know, I'd like to try this. And just for a bit of clarification, and, and, what uh, is Bizarro? Bizarro, it's it's um, it's really just strange. It's it's like you know how in horror or sci-fi or I don't know, pretty much any genre, it's grounded in some sort of reality. 
Bizarro yeah. just pretty much takes that concept and you know tosses it right out the window. It, it it can start from a completely strange setting or place or something or something like that. You know, I I don't want to pin it down uh, in as much as I as as in as much as I can avoid doing that because it it it's pretty much if it can come into your brain and you can string sentences together to describe it, you can say that's bizarro. It doesn't necessarily have to have a horror bent to it, but a lot of times it does because like really horrible disasters or disgusting kinds of things could be ha happening in that story. A lot of times that's what it is. It, it might be something disgusting, like you know, like in the, in the story I told you about. Uh, it was this guy, he was literally running from, from David Bowie because he was just coming after him trying to kill him. And the guy, the, the main character, his his girlfriend was a panda, and it it was just strange. I I can't really it it that's essentially what it is. It, it's strange, and the more I understood about the genre, the more I realized, oh, I've actually read other titles that that could be described as uh, uh, bizarro. And one of my favorite author, authors is Jimmy Pudge, and I would describe pretty much everything I've read by him as bizarro because it's just, it's just, it's strange and he's awesome. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his, but, oh, but to answer your question more fully, there are other genres as well. Um, I actually did just write a novel recently. That's uh, it's kind of like a mix between law and order and magic realism. It's not horror in the least. It's, it's just something that I wanted to kind of stretch my legs with and, and, you know, see if I could do it. Because I'd read some books with magic in them before, and I didn't really like them because, you know, pretty much the solution with any story with magic is, okay, come up with a spell that can resolve the issue eventually. And it, that seemed like a cheat to hard and fast rules to where you couldn't just whip up a new magical spell to, to, to save the day. It had to be something that falls in the rules of how magic works. Hmm. It's quite interesting, though you make me sound very mundane because I'm just a huge Michael Crichton fan. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm a very mundane person so, now. Yeah, that's that's uh... <laughs> well, and and that's one thing that I, I kind of like. I kind of like challenging myself. Just because it's something I haven't done doesn't mean don't try it. So you know, I I, I might even you know try to write a romance novel or something like that just to see if it's something I can do and if it's something that I would enjoy. So what can we expect in the future from you then? Any things in the works at the moment? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. The The novel I was just telling you about, it's, uh, it's called The Bureau of Retired Spells and Broken Magic. Uh, I'm, I'm right now shopping it around, trying to find an agent for it so hopefully i can get that landed soon and and uh, get them to shop it around to major publishers because I've, I've done small publishers i've done small uh, i'm sorry i've done small pun self-publishing and uh, i'd like to try again at uh, a major publisher and, and just most of them want you to have an agent first so i figured let me try to accomplish that so you said you've um been through self-publishing and through um, small publishers. Uh, what's your experience with working in both environments? They, they both have their benefits. Um, obviously, if you go through a small publisher, they're, they're handling a lot of the odds and ends that don't have anything to do with writing. You know, finding a cover artist, um, having your your, your work edited, things like that, so that you can just concentrate on, on just, you know, getting the best story that you can and then turning it over to them. But, you know, you, on the other side of that, uh, they want to make money off your story. So you're, you're sharing in that process. And, and with a small publisher, they still expect you to do some of the marketing. You know, they want you to talk about it on social media and, and, and you know, try to wedge in wherever you can. So far as talking about it with anybody who might be interested, you know, make a, setting up your own appearances. I haven't had a small publisher that that's taken care of that sort of thing for me, but um, self publishing, it's, it's really freeing because you're, you're completely un, unlicensed and you can write whatever you want to write. You don't have someone saying, well, 
take this out, take that out. I mean, you still want to definitely have an editor, no matter no matter which route you go you go through, because editing your own work that's a really difficult process. And some of my earlier stuff, I did do that. And there's nothing like having somebody else objectively look at what you've written to, you know, give you a perspective that you would not have necessarily considered. Um, uh, and and I, I have had, I have had uh, a couple titles published by major publishers because uh, Dead Till Dawn was published by uh, Kindle Press. So they had a professional editor. The only thing I really had to do with it, I had to pay for cover because it was um, through a program that they, they've since discontinued called Kindle Scout. Yeah. But that only cost me like $60. And once they liked it and decided, hey, we want to publish it, they went through the editing process for me and, you know, picked up the odds and ends that needed to be corrected. And uh, they put it out. And Amazon has actually done a pretty decent job of, of marketing because anytime you have a book, if you publish it yourself and you go and search for that book, more than likely, unless you've got an instant bestseller, you're going to be somewhere down the list when you search for the name of your book. But anytime I search for Dead Till Dawn, it's, it's if not the, the first item to pop up, it's like in the top five because Am- Amazon has you know put it in their algorithm because they published it. That they wanted to come to show up in, in a search uh, sooner. Hmm. So it, 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 they all have their benefits. There's no one to say this is far and above better than anybody else because they all have their different benefits. You know, once once I get to once I get to a, a, a one of the gatekeeper publishers, I'm sure that I might have an idea still. That they say, you know, well, we're not interested in that title, but we really like that you've written, you know, this book or this series. We want more of that. Um, that's a good problem to have because obviously that means if they want you to write a certain book, then, you know, there's an audience for it. But I think any writer who's been at it for any length of time will say, you know, I don't want to get pigeonholed into doing one thing. Yeah. So if you would say speak to any budding writers now what tips would you give them when it comes to publishing uh to anybody writing right now uh, take one problem at a time i'd say you know don't don't worry about if it's the best book ever written right now or what publisher will or won't want to publish you know once you have your idea lock into your idea Focus solely on that idea until you get it out. Don't worry about editing yourself. Uh, for me, what works best is just to throw everything up and uh, on the wall and, and see what whatever sticks. Right, just write until you get to the end of that story because self doubt is going to come in. And it's gonna, you're you're going to say to yourself, "Hey, it's not good. It's not going well. I should just stop and write something else. Write something better. Write something that you know." more market friendly all those kinds of thoughts come into just about every writer's mind i'm sure uh, at least at least it does for me but what i find is when i start thinking about the story in my mind it's not as good as when i turn around and i start reading again, reading it again i i most times i've written something you know that little voice in the back of your head tells you it's it's not the best and then i will always read it and say, well, this is a lot better than I was thinking for some reason. And then that, that kind of spurs me to, to, to go on or have more confidence in it. But it's really just tackling one problem at a time. You get your story written and, you know, then you kind of clean it up the best you can. And then you start looking for, depending on what you want to do, do you want to go through a small publisher, publish, do you want a large publisher, do you want an agent, whatever. It, depending on which route you want to go, you have a different path different tactic and for me my my case probably was a little bit different with my first novel because i shopped it to two publishers before the first one said they wanted it so i i I get that that's not necessarily what usually happens but that's what happened in in, in my case i found two publishers then the first one got back to me within a couple days and said hey can you hold off on sending sending it to anyone else because we want to consider it and i said uh, sure. I sent it to one other publisher and they said, well, can you hang on and, and uh, let us have first consideration? He got back to me within two weeks. They said, hey, do you want it? 
And so then I turned around and told the other publisher I sent to, hey, never mind, I got a publisher for it. So hmm. uh, first and foremost, I would say, have the confidence to to say, hey, you know what, I deserve to be talking to this person about my story. You know, don't feel like because of the reputation of whatever publisher that, oh, maybe I shouldn't try them. You know, try whoever you feel. So long as they're taking submissions, your story is just as worthy as anybody else's. I'm pretty sure quite a few people find that very opening. So back on to you and your writing. Um, How long has each novel and novella taken you to write? My first novel uh took me about a year um i don't really know how anybody else plots i know for me uh for the longest time the reason i hadn't written a book you know before you know 2009 was because i just didn't know how to plot i would start writing a story i think hey this is an awesome idea and i'd write and write and write until i got to a point where i was just stuck and didn't know where to go and one day i just grabbed a notebook and i just started writing down these ideas of all the stuff i wanted to happen in the story just like really summarizing everything and not really having a structure to the to the plot i was writing but just just jotting down all the ideas and it made me it made me more able to visualize where i was going and what direction i what direction i i wanted to go and if and if i found something that wasn't working while I was summarizing, I would just erase and you know rewrite rather than having pages upon pages. I had probably when I finished summarizing it, I probably had about twenty between ten and twenty pages, I would guess. And the weird thing about it is when I had written that summary, I don't know, I guess I committed enough of it to memory to where I never referenced it again after that, and I was able to just write the story all the way through. And I I wrote that first draft by hand. Wow. That must have been then, some, you must have had some serious everything. And from. I think I started, I started, oh yeah, oh yeah, yes I did. And I was writing everywhere. I was writing at home, I was writing, I think I was doing customer service at the time where, where I was working. I was writing in between phone calls. I was writing, writing on my lunch breaks. I was writing on my breaks. Uh, you know, I might even write it if I was stuck. Like, and uh, I think I started in like December 2008. And then I finished in like January 2010. So it was like a year and change. And uh, that, that was for my first novel. Since then, I, I've been able to write a, a little bit faster because I've refined my own process. I still do what I did back then, but I just have a different way of uh, of doing it that works for me. Um, like the novel I just I just finished that I'm looking for an agent for, I started it um, during Nano Remo last year. Do you do you do you ever do Nano Remo? Uh, no, I don't. Oh. I've never well, heard it, of it. It's before. something I've been wanting to do for the longest time, and I would. Well, well, you should look into it. If, if you write, you should look into it. It's something that's really fun. Uh, could you clarify it for anyone listening? It's, uh, it's, it's, sure, sure, absolutely. It's, it's, it's called NaNoWriMo or NaNoWriMo, however you want to pronounce it. But it's uh, National Novel Writing Month. Hmm. Wow. The idea <laughs> is to... The, the idea is to write as much as you can during that month and, if possible, finish a full novel. I think the goal is supposed to be like 50,000 words. And and the, and the cool thing about it is, is even if you fail, you've pushed so hard that even if you didn't finish the novel, you should have a significant chunk of it worthy of finishing. And that's what I had. I, I, um, I put together a writing schedule for myself. I said, okay, I want to have a story that's X amount of words. I don't remember what it was at uh, uh, now. And so I broke it down. So that means I needed to write, I don't know, 2,000 words a day. So 2,000 words a day at the end of 30 days is 60,000 words. Even if you're not done with the whole novel, you have 60,000 words written of a new work in a month's time. That's fantastic. And so what you can do is, you know, you, you can... 
go on, go onto their website, you know, register and everything, and you can just log in your word count by day. So you can see, and then you can invite other people to look at it. And it's, it's, it's really a cool way of helping to urge other people on and being urged on to, to, you know, just bang out that novel. Wow. So what difficulties have you faced when writing? Um, the biggest difficulties I've faced in writing is self-doubt. That's the biggest one by far, where you just think, oh, this isn't good enough. I should just stop writing it. That's the biggest one. If you can ignore that voice hard enough and just push, you know, uh, everything else kind of falls into place. And then the, the thing about it that, you know, I also had to realize when I was trying to find time to write, it's like, well, I've got time to play games on my phone, watch TV shows and do all kinds of things that really don't have, you know, value. You know, you're not really doing anything. It's like, well, I can carve out some of that time at least to focus on writing. And and I also have uh, been able to uh, do other things to, 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 to steal time. Like um, I use Google Docs a lot. And that's that, that's an app that I can put right on my phone. So if I'm sitting in a doctor's office just waiting to be called in, I can, you know, I can write a couple hundred words or something on the app on my phone. And it even has a, hit the dictate button and then I just talk into my phone and, and, and get a lot of words written out. I've, I've done that a whole lot. I wrote, uh, I would, I would dictate uh, a whole short to my phone while I was walking. I do apologize, but at this point we did start suffering with some technical difficulties. In basic terms, the curse hates me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I dictate a lot because it, it's, it's a really, uh, good hands-free way of writing. So say, say if I'm, uh, Walking my dog, uh, I can I get a lot of stuff done that way. You can't really tack away with your thumbs if you know you're you're walking your dog around on a leash. But you know I can dictate into my phone um, if I'm stuck on the freeway or something like that because there's an accident. I can grab my phone and I can I can probably uh, do a couple hundred words or something like that. Or if I'm a passenger in the car or something like that, I can I can do a lot of writing because it, it, it's because it's Google Docs and it's an app on my phone. I can write pretty much anywhere I go. Uh, prior to using Google Docs, I had actually bought one of these. Um, it's a uh, uh, it's a keyboard that you can plug into any computer. You can you can write. The only thing you can do on this thing is write, and it was excellent. I for, for before I started using an app to write, um, I would use this thing, and the only thing you can do on it is write. So you can't surf the internet, check your email, or whatever. It, it keeps you really honest, and then whatever you've written, you can just plug into your file on your computer. And then you just hit a send button and then we'll just, everything you type, it will put into the document. I still have that thing and I should probably still use it on occasion, but uh, I'm really hooked on writing on uh, Google Docs at this point. Well, I'm now downloading Google Docs onto my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I highly suggest that you, you will find that just by having that app with you wherever you go, your, product, your productivity should shoot up big time. I know, based off your tip, I'm going to be dictating to it while I'm in the car. <laughs> <laughs> yep, just you, like, you absolutely can do that. Because otherwise I would never get a chance to write. It, it sucks mm -hmm. I haven't been able to write in like three months. And I'm in the process of writing a book that's feeling very neglected. <laughs> oh, I, I've been there, so I definitely understand. I even um, I even created my own spreadsheet. Um, it's... Um, in Google Google Sheets, another you know Google product, but uh, I I pretty much set how many words I want my total word to be. You know, just an estimation because you know if you go over, great. But if the store is told in fewer words, then that's okay too. And I just that total word count, I I will set my writing period like I'm giving myself X amount of days to write this work. So out of that many days, divide that into the total word count and so that sets how many words i need to write per day and then i'll just each day log 
okay, this day I actually only wrote this many words, so it'll show me how many words I was short or how many words I was over, and it keeps a running tally of my total. And that helps to keep me honest too, because I, I get to see in real time how much I'm actually writing rather than, you know, just thinking, hey, you know, I think I wrote a pretty good amount. You know, I, I by using that spreadsheet, I saw that um, I fell way short of my goal in the month of December, but come January, I shot way up. I, I had a one day that I wrote over 10,000 words. It's by chance and just, you know, just the, the, the spirit hit me to write as much as I wrote that particular day. I don't know how I did it because it's really, that's, a, that's, that's a really aggressive total for a word count in a, in a single day, but I was actually able to do it. But you know, yeah, I'll, I'll, if you want to see it, I will share with you what I use, what I, what I, what I put together. And you can personalize it for your own stuff. Every time I decide I'm writing a new novel, I always use a spreadsheet because it helps me to keep track of where I am so far as how much I'm writing. And it's, it's, for me, it's fun, but I'm weird. So, well, if you'd mind. like to share it in the Faith Hill Facebook group, um, Faith Hill Productions Facebook group, that I'm sure a lot of writers in there would find it very handy. Um, sure, so I can on, do that. On to my next question, which is. Do you ever base any of your characters on real life people? Um, I've based a couple of my main characters on an aspect of myself. Uh, certain things about my personality uh, I've injected into a couple of my characters. Uh, um, I've more or less begun settling into writing into writing real life locations, like places I've really been or places I've lived because uh, I feel like I can create a more rich uh, background or setting when it's, you know, someplace that I can see and, and touch and walk around as opposed to cutting, uh, cutting, cutting the scene out of whole cloth, you know, someplace that doesn't exist or someplace I've never been to. Uh, but uh, in, in Dead Till Dawn, I, I did have... I guess a fictionalized version of a real person just for a little comedic effect because uh I didn't really have the person do anything bad or good. It was just it was just uh something that was said about the person. So um I've done it a couple of times, but I haven't had any significant characters based on real people other than me. And it's more of an aspect of me that I wouldn't really expect anybody to pick up on. Okay, so that sounds pretty interesting. Um, I know that you have to leave, so I'm going to wrap it up now because I don't want you like getting too wrapped up with the Kraken or something and missing what you've got going on. So it was truly a pleasure to have you here, and I hope you don't lose any limbs to the Kraken. He has been in a particularly foul mood this week. And thank okay. you so much for assisting me in keeping my sanity. Not a problem at all. It was a it was a pleasure to speak with you. It was a pleasure to have you here. Have a nice evening. Uh, you too. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Well, I hope you found that interview insightful. I know I certainly did. I started downloading Google Docs straight on my phone during the interview. Sorry if that seems a bit rude, but I didn't want to forget it. And well, after all, being trapped in such a cursed lands. Forgetting things can be rather easy. Just saying. And that marks the end of the first segment of The Cursed Kingdom, Episode 5. And just a quick reminder, if you do like the content on this channel, don't forget to click that subscribe button and give us a like. Today's goal is to reach 10 likes, so please help us get there. I mean, 10 likes is nothing, really, isn't it? So now let us appreciate the works of Grave Robber with their song, Zombieland. Grave Robber have been hard at work horrifying the masses since 2005. They have been anything but idle. And with it getting closer to Halloween with every passing minute, let's hope that they bring a chill to your spine. <laughs>
So now, let us enter the world of the fantastical, the terrifying, the horrifying, the, well, I'll let you decide. Beginning with As They Laid Me Down to Die by Marie Lanza. I watched my death in a mirror, a reflection before me so gruesome the only thing that seemed real was the pain. The first bite was excruciating as the monster ripped through my flesh. Its teeth sank into my shoulder, sending a throbbing agony straight to my gut and the sound of squishy crunching filling my ears. My stomach reacted with the need to vomit, but nothing came up. The second monster wasn't far behind, chewing at my arm with such a strong bite it felt as though it punctured straight to the bone. My body crumbled to the ground as my legs couldn't hold me up any longer, with the dead weight of these two beasts leaning on me. I'm not sure how long I screamed before those screams were silenced. Silenced by shock, I assume, if this is what going into shock is like. Everything was getting quiet around me, like I was travelling farther away down a tunnel, and I was looking back at the reflection in the mirror being torn apart by flesh-eating rabid monsters. My insides burned and ached as the blood poured from my body. There I lay watching my death in a mirror. It was a simple choice to die, but not one taken lightly. It was me, or both of us, and no mother in this world would willingly allow their child to die such a death. So I lay, as my body was ripped open and consumed, my mind was able to escape and shut down the torturous pain. The saying is true about life flashing before your eyes. I saw my beautiful memories. I saw my little girl. It was all so bright and serene peace cast over me. This is where I wanted to stay. This is where I hoped it would end. But then I reminded myself my little girl was still hiding behind that mirror. I put her back there, trying to hide from these creatures, but there was no room for both of us and nowhere else to hide. So I put her there, hoping my death would save her. I hoped she would stay quiet. I hoped she would survive. There I lay, watching my death in this mirror. Will I bleed to death? Will I come back as one of these creatures? I lay there wondering what would become of me. I wondered what would become of my little girl. It didn't take long for my vision to get fuzzy and my mind began falling into darkness. I was slipping into a shallow hell, my body numb from the pain. I listened to their chewing, my blood and muscles sloshing as they satisfied their hunger. There I lay, trying to fight the darkness. Did this darkness mean I was turning into one of them, or was I dying? Maybe it was the same thing. Maybe death was still living, but in this new form. The air was shallow, wheezing each last breath from my lungs. It was so dark. There I lay wondering if this burning was the sickness rushing through my veins. If I come back as these creatures, will I remember me? Will anything be left or will I be a shell of something I once was? If I hunger like they do, will I remember my little girl is hiding behind the mirror as my last conscious act I prayed that I would not? As they laid me down to die, I watched through the mirror until darkness settled in. Until soon, everything was black. Everything was silenced when they laid me down. Wow, I must say I really do enjoy Marie Lanza's work, and I hope you do too. <laughs> if only she would release a novel or something in the eye- through the eyes of the little girl, 
it would be amazing to see what her story is after the death of her mother. Or at least it is in my opinion. I know today's short story, well, first short story was quite short, but it was enjoyable. You can't go wrong at that. And it's nice to have a really short story for a change, you know? But I am going to use this time, seeing as we have a couple of minutes before I will be resuming in the short story segment with the fact that the first short story was so short, to tell you a few things as what's to come and what to expect in the near future. So, next month is October, which is the month of Halloween, and there is a lot planned for you guys, including a zombie special, a paranormal and ghostly special, and a hell of a lot more. So, I look forward to sharing all of that with you. And because next month is the month of the scariest day of the year, I have to ask you yet again, to answer in the comment section below what scares you the most. So please don't forget to comment in the comment section below what scares you the most. And I apologize in advance, but I am gonna butcher this um, author's last name because there's no chance in hell I'm gonna get it right. I just know I'm not. So I'm so sorry in advance. Open Window by Mandy Jehnik. When Lily met James, it was not what you would consider one of life's biggest triumphs. In fairness to James, he was in the hospital and in a cast, a souvenir from his idiot uncle who had been raising him since his idiot parents dropped him in foster care. Because they liked drugs way more than they liked him. James told the doctor he was being abused, but it really didn't matter. What could they do about it? He would either go back into the system or back into the house. Just another thing in a long line of things he couldn't control. He tried to kill himself, saved all of his pain pills and then took them all at once. Somehow, even though he picked the middle of the night when nobody was around, they got to him fast enough to pump his stomach. So, it was really a nightmare time for someone to come in and try to be his friend, especially someone toting homework. Except, she didn't really try. This girl in her Walmart jeans and David Bowie t-shirt she dropped his homework on his nightstand and took over his television set. They watched a whole episode of Hannibal in silence, James occasionally side-eyeing her. She looked vaguely familiar, but he couldn't even start to remember her name. One of his classmates, he guessed. She silently offered him a skittle, but he ignored her. He didn't feel like playing indulge the loony. Although, really, who was he to call someone a loony? At least she was harmless as far as he knew. When the show was over, she stood, threw away her garbage and left with a thanks, see you tomorrow. She was gone before James could tell her not to come. It happened all that week. She came in, dropped his homework off, homework he never did, broke out some form of candy or another, and they watched the show. It was weird, but not really uncomfortable. James was just grateful that it wasn't Real Housewives of Atlanta or something. He snitched up her whole box of milk duds, just to see what she would do. She stole it back and brought in an extra box the next day. The rest of his day was usually shit. A bunch of people sitting around, staring at him, waiting for him to give an explanation of why he was so screwed up that they didn't feel safe letting him take his own medication. At least a couple of those people had PhDs in front of their names. So they should have known better. But they just sat there watching James's family fake cry into their hands with looks of sympathy and cheap Kleenex. 
they moved into the children's ward with the rest of the long termers on Friday when the girl showed up. He didn't even give her a chance to sit. I'm going to commit suicide, he said, like he was telling her what he ate for breakfast. You're going to? Like, tomorrow? Wednesday? You've considered it, but haven't found the right time? She tilted her head. Should I not bring your homework to you on Monday? Oh God, don't ever be a grief counsellor. Wasn't planning on it. Listen, seriously, you don't want to hang around me. Jesus on a stick, she spat. I hate it when people say that. I don't go around saying, you don't want Chinese food when you're a Jones Singh for an egg roll, so quit telling me what I want. Unless you have a better objection to my presence than your belief that your personality is somehow infectious, I'm going to hang around you. Do you have a better objection? James looks at her, surprised at her feminence. It was refreshing. He was sick of people tiptoeing around him, treating him like glass, modifying their words to be more politically correct. God, he hated politically correct. Jesus on a stick? She grinned. A really big stick. Two sticks, actually. What's your name? Lily. Did you bring Sour Patch Kids? She removed a yellow package from her backpack and handed it to him. And eventually, they talked. It was easy stuff at first. Doritos versus Cheetos. Music. Movies. She would never let him talk when Mads Mikkelsen was talking. She said it was rude, and Hannibal hated the rude. James, in turn, would do little things to break her attention. Drink her soda, stack pens, throw a Kleenex in the air over and over and over. It never occurred to him to ask why she was there, and she never volunteered information. The doctors weren't making any headway on helping him cope, but Lily stuck around, and that sort of seemed like a victory. This isn't going to be one of those sappy teen novels, is it? He asked her one day, almost a month after they had first met. Angst, angst, pathos, they fall in love, death. I don't know. You tell me. Do you love me? Do you love me? He countered, surprised when she nodded her head. Yes, but love isn't the same as live. James thought about that. He hadn't really ever been loved that he could remember. I'll take your word for it. She planted her chin on both fists, blinked her eyes at him. Are you sure? We could. But James had noticed something. She was wearing short sleeves for the first time and he hooked his finger around the plastic band on her right arm. Really? I've been sitting next to your bed practically every day for a month and you just now realise that I'm wearing a hospital bracelet? Billy laughed. And here I was just thinking you were polite. What? James swallowed, suddenly choking on fear. What do you have? If he was lucky, she'd be like him. Not that having a severe mental disorder was really lucky, but at least he would, his only friend wouldn't be... Something terminal. Does it really matter? You've been dying this whole time and you didn't say a word. Yeah, well, maybe I wanted to deal with someone else's existential dreadful ones. I do love you. The words came out reluctantly, as though being pulled from him. Shit, God damn it, I do! Duh. Now that you know I don't have that much time left, it's safe to say, so you did. Lily dropped her gaze to her hands. Yet another good reason for not telling you anything. The fragile is always more precious. But I don't want your love to be a death perk, so I reject it. Come up with something better, okay? Lily, honey. 
the epitome of a sweet little old lady popped her head around the door. James recognised her as Esther. She was a regular volunteer on the children's ward. Sorry to interrupt, but... Concert night, right. Lily rolled her eyes. You know, one of the best things about being in here? You don't have to sing. Froggy went courting in front of 300 people. Froggy went courting? What the hell is Froggy went courting? You remember Mr. Long, the high school choir director? He said that if he heard one more profanity in his class, he'd make us sing something wholesome at spring concert. Apparently, he's not a liar. It's adorable, Esther claimed. Lily rolled her eyes, mimed heaving her guts all over the floor. Lily! Yes, Grammy, she smiled sweetly and skipped toward the door. See you tomorrow? But Lily didn't come again for two days. When she finally did show up, he decided to punish her. James pretended to be asleep the whole time she was there. After a couple of hours, he dozed for real. They had changed his medication that day and it was wreaking havoc on his sleeping patterns. When he woke up, the first thing he heard was Esther and Lily having a heated conversation beside him. James kept his eyes carefully closed. We can't take Adam yet, Lily whispered, hissed. Grammy, his parents aren't even here. The drivers are... Shh. Esther hushed her. She must have looked over at James because Lily snorted. He couldn't hear the black parade go by. Lily, I know, I know. Names have power. Let's go before he proves you wrong. James kept his eyes closed as he listened to Lily sigh then get quietly to her feet. He counted 500 before he threw his legs over the side of the bed and cautiously poked his head around the door. He didn't see Esther or Lily, but he knew the name, Adam Driver. James spent a lot of time on the cancer kids floor. He was the perfect height for the Spider-Man costume and it wasn't like he was going on a bunch of dates or anything. Adam was a placeholder. There was no cure for what he had but that didn't stop them from using him as a guinea pig. His parents were watchers, always around, waiting, petting, smiling brave smiles whenever Adam was awake, praying with grim eyes when he wasn't. James peeked his head around Adam's door. Esther and Lily were standing side by side next to Adam's bed and Lily was still arguing. Her voice came back to him with surprising clarity, even though she was whispering. It felt like everything had been muted. The nurse's call bell, the incessant beeping of the vitals monitor. Even when someone flushed the toilet in the next room, it barely registered as a sound. Can't we wait? We are cutting it close as it is, Lily. Yeah, but he's such a fighter. You say that as though he had any choice in the matter. You know what I mean! Lily shot Esther a look that James knew well. He was brave! He was. Esther agreed, gently brushing a clump of hair away from Adam's forehead. The little boy didn't even stir. And now he gets to rest. His dad and brother are just in the cafeteria, Lily pleaded. Esther turned her head, a frown on her normally mild features. And by the time you get them, Adam will miss his window. But it's not! Don't you dare say fair, Lily Hughes. You know what we do has nothing to do with fair. Lily turned her head with a huff and caught eyes with James for a moment. She just stared at him, then she mouthed. Go. James went. He ran through the halls, practically tackled Mr. Driver when he finally found him. The look on James's face must have convinced him because he came without a word. 
When they came back in, the heart monitor was screaming. Mr. Driver gathered his boy up, oblivious of the nurses surrounding him, and hugged him close. But James had eyes only for the brown-haired child in Esther's arms. Adam, flatlining on the bed, frail, drawn, and pale. Adam, asleep in Esther's arms, rosy-cheeked and breathing normally. Catch him, the nurse said sharply. James blinked at Lily in surprise. He hadn't even seen her move, but she had his arm around her shoulders, supporting him. Let's go, she commanded. But let's go. Esther came with them, still carefully cradling Adam. Adam's spirit, Adam's imprint, soul. James was swaying on his feet again. Can you handle him, sweetie? Get Adam home. Lily replied. They went left and Esther went right. And when James looked back, Esther wasn't there. He didn't remember the walk back to his room or Lily pressing a coke into his hands. Drink this. You look like a ghost. He was halfway through it before his brain caught up. Holy shit! James exploded, soda spraying all over the floor. She's death! Esther, you... Lily nodded. You are death! I am a death, Lily corrected. There's more than one? Think about it. In the various cultures around the world, is death ever the same? No, no, no. Wait. I'm just... James pulled on his hair while Lily watched, amusement in her eyes. I'm completely tripping out. You're the Grim Reaper. Wrong again. I'm Lily. The Grim is the Grim. The Pale Horseman is the Pale Horseman. Completely separate. You... James sat, his thumb tapping an erratic rhythm on the arm of the chair before he stood back up and resumed pacing. You better explain this to me. In small words, please, my brain is going to explode. Okay. Lily settled back, took a deep breath. Soulmates, you've heard of them, right? At his nod, she continued. People want to think that it's all about love. It's not really. It's about having someone to walk out of life with. Someone who makes you feel less alone. That's why we're here. We're born, just like any baby, without memories or any supernatural mumbo-jumbo, and raised beside humans until we find the one. Then, everything comes flooding back and we have a short window of time to finish our exit. When our human is safely, wherever they end up, we go back and do it all again. And again. And again. So when we die, you die too? Essentially. Ever wonder why some people have vivid memories of their past lives? They were death. A death. She corrected herself. Right. They remembered that girl that never really fits in with her family, the six-year-old who acts like your grandmother. It's a really good bet that they're death. Do you remember how old I am? What a terrible thing to ask a woman! Lily rolled her eyes when he didn't so much as crack a smile. I don't know exactly. I'd get flashes when I was younger. A man in a toga, a woman with ridiculously large hats, going for rides in a car with huge fins. But I couldn't tell you where or when I started. So what kind of death are you? You said there were different kinds. Sure. You saw Adam. The baby who dies is met by kindness. Someone gentle like Esther. Someone who's been an arsehole their whole lives is probably going to meet the Grim. You can't bargain, wheedle, or plead around the Grim. He just plain doesn't care. 
and all your bluster isn't going to phase him. You're completely helpless. Just how you made others feel. True believer is likely going to be met with whatever form of angel their religion conjures. Someone truly evil will be hauled away by the pale rider. If you're beyond redemption, and very few people are, you'll just be left alone. When you die, you'll have no guide, and it's likely your soul will be lost in the maelstrom and torn to pieces. You don't have to worry about that though, because I've got you. Lily didn't answer. Her attention was focused on a loose string on the edge of her coat. James frowned, but curiosity was still pinging questions like pinballs in his head. You didn't tell me who you were, besides Lily. Compassion. I'm compassionate, Death. Something drove you to try and end it all. I'm the friend that should have stepped up and stopped you, but either didn't or couldn't. She finally raised her eyes to his. You've had a really shitty life. You didn't need to have a really shitty death. Um, thanks, I think? James's frantic tapping stilled. You said that you had a really short window. Is mine almost up? I don't know. You don't know? How can you not know? Because Lily went blank, staring out the window at the scrubby crabapple tree in the yard. She was obsessively pulling at the string and the edge was starting to come loose. James watched for a couple of seconds before he got up and sat beside her. It's okay. You don't have to tell me. Maybe it's easier that I don't know. It's all about you, huh? She said with a faint smile. Well... Death is pretty personal. You should know. You've done it before. I've been reborn before. I've never died, exactly. I'm afraid. The last two words were spoken in a whisper so soft that James would have missed it if his senses hadn't been so keyed up. Lily, can death die? I'm guessing so, since... I'm dying. You just know that. Sure, it's like a chime in my head. Hard to explain, but I know it's time. You're not immortal. Only sure thing is death and taxes and all that. He attempted a stab at humour. No way. It's the same reason why Congress should have term limits. You get stagnant. Also, immortal beings get snooty. They forget why they started, get involved in us v them, and then you get crusades, the holocaust, Cromwell. Her hands went still. I wasn't kidding. A life is only precious if it ends. The rarity makes it valuable, and apparently that extends to death too. Hmm, a voice purred from the dark causing them to jump. You forgot Khmer Ro, Rwand and the Ottomans. He stepped into the light. He was a young man, barely more than a teenager with reddish hair and washed out blue eyes. He was dressed in a white soot suit with streaks of red and black splattered upon it and a wide brimmed hat. Oh, and we just cannot forget... He snapped his fingers. The Inquisition was a show. Inquisition, here we go. He did some soft shoe tap, despite the fact that his feet were bare and finished with a spin. He may have been a genocidal lunatic, but Tokamida had a tremendous singing voice. You, Lily hissed. Me! The other man with the wide-brimmed hat said with a grin. He took off his hat in a mockery of a polite bow. His eyes glowed a sickly yellow. 
I love the smell of despair and fear in the morning. It smells like he stuck his long, dark red tongue out and dragged it across his lips in an obscene gesture of avarice. Breakfast. Get the hell out, Whitey! Lily yelled. James is mine. This man is suicidal. That's despair. He leaned in close to whisper. That makes him mine. I don't... James stuttered and drew closer to Lily. Is he... Are you the devil? The man in the white suit laughed. Oh no, I'm as human as you are. Well, okay, I was human. As you, anyhow. I did get the opportunity to meet the legend. Overall, not that impressed. Who are you? The man placed a finger on his lower lip and tapped it contemplatively. Oh... I've got a lot of names. My most recent title I earned just a little while ago in Syria was Wabad Tuan. Screw your fancy titles. He's pestilence. Lily spat. Plague. A sadistic torture that became too much for hell to deal with. And so he was exiled and somehow made a horseman. The White Horseman of Revelations. But he reaps people like you do? Nothing like me. Lily spun on him. He feeds on fear and despair, drawn to slaughter and genocide. Wabba shrugged. What can I say? Wherever there is a child with a swollen belly and Sally Struth is narrating his plight, I am there. Wherever people are rounded up into temples of wood and barbed wire and in their despair and terror beg for death, that's me. Wabba's grin turned predatory. Wherever a young man decides to end it all and cash out, well, you get the idea. But he didn't cash out, so you can step up. Because you changed the rules, didn't you? Wabba replied. Tell him the real reason, you're dying little brat. The real reason? James looked from Lily to Wabba. The look on Lily's mobile face woke a sick dread in the pit of his stomach. Compassion. Well, it's like a cockroach. No matter how much you stomp on it, it grows and thrives, Baba told him conversationally. It doesn't ever just keel on its own. More's the pity. Shut up, Whitey. Lily stood, squaring her shoulders. James could see the white of ancient years behind her unassuming demeanour. No one's window is open yet. So take a long walk off a short pier. I have claim to the territory. Capiche? Wabba snorted. Whatever you say, the short stack. He traced a finger across a shelf and examined it disdainfully as it came back dusty. Tell me something, James. Have you ever heard of the term false hope? Well, yeah. He crossed his arms over his chest. But you're a demon from hell. Why would I care what you say? Formerly of hell. Currently in the employ of the great cosmic balance, Wabba corrected. And you should listen to me for a simple reason. I will never lie to you. Oh, come on. You're a murderer. Oh, on a biblical scale, no question. He shrugged. I've soaked my hands in the blood of the firstborn and been witness to the sight, sound and scent of babies tossed into ovens. He leaned in. But never once did I lie about any of it. He cast a yellow-eyed glare at Lily. Unlike others... You see, James, he elaborated, hope is the ultimate lie. It's the belief that if you just close your eyes and have faith, everything will ultimately work out. The sterile white walls. How well has that worked out for you, James? Hope is the carrot dangled before the horse to keep him plodding along like a good little slave until he drops dead. A failed and unfulfilled husk of a life form. So, you're saying what? That there's no hope? I'm saying that you don't need hope. 
He gestured at Lily. Don't be led around the nose by her and her vague promises of something better that may or may not actually happen. Hope is smoke and mirrors. He held out his hand and a small plume of yellow flame burst into life. But fear, fear is tangible. Fear is real. It's the first emotion you experience when you're torn naked and screaming from your mother's nethers and it's the last sensation you get to have before one of us comes for you. Fear, as opposed to faith, can always be relied upon. I don't understand your offering me fear. Oh no, I'm offering you a release from your fear. And, oh man, you have so much to be afraid of. Wubba quirked an eyebrow. Don't believe me? Here, you brought the yellow flame closer. Look deep into the fire and tell me what you see. Don't! Lily tried to stop him. James peered deep into the fire. For a moment, all he could see was yellow light. And then, he felt it. A sickness that soaked into his soul. He saw millions of people being tortured, billions, trillions and more. Each one was more horrible than the last, and there were an infinite of agonies that stretched on and on and on and on. And... No! James screamed. He noticed to his shame that he was cowering in the corner. Lily crouched beside him. Feel that? Like your soul is trying to vacate your body out of any possible way it can. Weber said with a smile. That's that fear we were talking about. What you saw was a sneak preview of what a person like you can expect in their afterlife. Souls in despair who do violence unto themselves. Souls that don't know the rules of conventional mortality. Well, they only have one place to go. That was hell, yes, Wobber confirmed. And put your chances at about three out of four that that's where you'll be going, gestured at Lily. Oh, you can certainly hope that the judge will be merciful, but then so did most of those people you saw, in fact. Wobber grinned. I actually have a list of names that died filled with hope from Lily that they'd see paradise only to wind up in the fire. Would you like me to share their names with you? That's absolute bullshit! Lily roared as she surged to her feet. Not a single soul that I've guided has ever landed in hell. She turned to James. Talking about cockroaches, he and his bastard siblings wait until... I'm guiding us all, and they'll swoop in on the others. Despair is easy, she said, contemptuously. It takes no time at all. Compassion is harder. Wabba shrugged. What I'm offering you, James, is this. I guarantee that you'll not face hell. You won't face anything. In fact, you'll simply cease to exist. No afterlife. No demons or angels, just blessed peace and oblivion. It will end, all of it will end, and you'll have reached a place where neither fear, nor pain, nor shame can ever touch you again. You have my word. Get out. Lily stepped in between Wabba and James, fists clenched. Wabba stepped forward to meet her, clearly ready for a fight but stopped with a frown. James looked closer. The air between them was dancing like dust motes in the air. Wabba took another experimental step and was pressed back, but it made Lily sway. You have claim for now, he said with a grin. He walked to the door, threw two finger salutes from the brim of his hat. Until next time, Lily dear, James, this is where the angst comes in. Lily lunged at him, practically chased him out the door. 
Nobody watches Sally Struthers anymore, you asshat. She yelled down the hall. What was that? That was... Well, really never finished her sentence. She swayed again and then collapsed in a heap. James screamed for a nurse, but all he could do was watch helplessly as they loaded his best friend onto a gurney and wheeled her away. It was James's turn to wait. It took some wheedling, but the nurse finally let him in. When Esther came in, he was prepared to defend himself with a hundred different arguments, but she just sat beside him. What happened? He told her all about Wabba and about the yellow fire and his words and Lily's shield. Esther started shaking her head at the mention of the white horseman and didn't stop until the end of James's story. That snake, she spat. The horsemen will have their day. They know that, but patience was never something he learned. I'm sorry you had to go through. Is he right? It was a question that had been haunting James since he heard Robert's words. Was it possible to just wink out? What would happen if he did? Yes. Esther replied, gently taking his hand. And no. Which? It can't be both. I'm not sure in your case. Lily, she changed the rules. He said that too. What exactly did she do? She... Esther sighed. She took your window. What? That night, you took all those pills. She refused to let you go on. She took your death on herself. Wait, so I didn't screw it up. She stole my suicide? James felt fury flood through him. He could have been beyond, maybe in hell, but maybe not. Definitely out of here. And Lily had just sat with him day after day, listened to him, made him laugh remembered things about him, like his favourite band, favourite candy, went and got his favourite sweatshirt and books out of his house. How she had pulled that off, he still wasn't sure. Was that just compassion? Was it just for him? Or would she have done that for anyone? He didn't realise that he had asked the question until Esther squeezed his hand. You don't die for just anyone, James. She didn't. Not for hundreds of years. She saw something in you. I brought him. Willie's voice was faint around the oxygen mask. Robert, he smelled my fit. I'm sorry. You should rest. Esther brushed her hand down Willie's hair. Talk to James. Lily held out her hand. Phone. She typed for a while, halting frequently, shutting her eyes against the brightness with a look of pain that wasn't her at all. When she was done, she handed it back to James and fought back against the pillow with a sigh. It was a list. James knew a few of the names. Martin Luther King, Jr. Owen Rommel, Susan B. Anthony. He raised an eyebrow when he got to Dolly Parton? Grew up poor as hell, illiterate father. Could have tanked, been bitter, angry, but instead, she sends free books to kids, doesn't judge. Willie sucked in a breath. Brave, they all are. Karen and Jamie Moyer, Paul Newman, Corey Ten Boom, Irina Sendler, Neil Armstrong, Freddie Mercury, Alan Ginsberg, and on and on. Read, Lily commanded. They didn't take the easy way out, could have easily. She pulled in another breath. The air whistling through her lungs like wind through a cracked window. 
okay guys, the nurse chose the inopportune time to come in. She needs rest. I'll read, you sleep. Lily grabbed his hand. Don't! I won't let him mess with you, James reassured. He must have guessed correctly because she smiled at him and laid her head back. Esther kissed her forehead with tears in her eyes. James parked himself outside her door on a bright blue bathing couch. Would you like a snack? James shook his head and Esther disappeared down the hall. James read. He was most of the way through the list when Bubba showed up. So, short stack's really hitting the exit ramp, huh? He grinned. Wah, wah, wah. He said, mimicking the oh no moments in the old cartoons. Looks like James kept his voice neutral. There was something different. He had noticed it before. His lily grew weaker. He felt stronger. His vision, hearing, all clearer than they had ever been. It was like waking up. And as he looked at Wabba, he saw things that he hadn't before. The tick near his eye, the way he never still. The greyish cast to his skin. He may have feared him before, and a shade of that fear was still active deep down, but it was manageable. She bought you some time, enough to live it up before you just... Wabba snapped his fingers. Lucky dog. You say that like it's already a done deal. It is, unless you're a dumbass. Are you, James? I might just be. James went back to reading. He was on the last person on Lily's list, Fred Rogers. I might not. Being ignored was driving Weber insane. James could feel the pulse of irritation from across the hall, but for some reason he wasn't approaching, wasn't antagonising, so James read. When I was a boy, and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. It was a famous quote from Mr. Rogers. James even remembered seeing it in a meme on Facebook. Despair is easy. James could hear Lily's voice in his head, clear as if she was standing beside him. Compassion is harder. It was hard. After all James had been through, it was still practically impossible to think of his parents without contempt and his uncle without rage. How many more of them were there as opposed to the helpers? Too many, he thought. His mind wandered back to the night he had decided he was going to be his last. Even his helper had done something unethical. It had been his choice, his, and she had stolen it. No matter that, she had done it for what she thought was his own good. Across the hall, Robert grinned and pushed himself off the wall. He took a careful step forward. James felt a push, but it was weak. Maybe I'll go say hey to a little bit. Robert tossed out casually. Feels like I won't have a bunch more time. There's so much I'd love to cram down her throat. Things to gloat over. You stay the hell away from her. You don't get it, do you? She took your window, Jimmy. That means she gets your guy too. Wabba flung his arms out, did a barefoot spin. Me, 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 me. His voice soared to operatic levels. He finished with an air drum solo and a wicked smile. Damn, but don't you know for how long I've been trying to stomp her out? You did it all for me. Don't worry. Robert swept his hat from his head. 
I'll make her see the error of stealing someone's right to choose. You. James felt the shield strengthen. So Bubba frowned. Now don't be like that. It's not everybody who gets a deferment. You just go live your life. And when you're good and done, you'll just wink out. Easy peasy. Leave now. Injustice is done. It's that simple. Action, reaction, James. Cause and effect. Window's not open yet. Wubba's eyes narrowed. Now how the hell would you know that? James didn't know, but he knew. It wasn't... She had time. Let me. Oh, for fuck's sake. Wubba waved his hand toward the door. Go have your kissy kissy teen novel moment and then get lost, would you? I haven't got all night. James sat beside Lily. She was ghostly pale, hardly able to catch her breath despite the oxygen mask over her nose and mouth. Seeing her like this, it made James a little queasy, like when he saw deer strung up after a hunt. Maybe it had a purpose, maybe it even had a reason, but that didn't make it easier to see. She didn't even stir when James took her hand. James had a choice. He could take her place. Now that he was beside her, James could see everything. Her whole long life, the ones who came before her. He felt her power, her strength, siphoning off into his body. He could become what she was, compassionate death. He could make sure that no one had to suffer alone as he had. He, and he alone, could save Lily from Wubba's tender mercies. But then, he would be subject to the judge, as Wubba had called her. And this judge. James couldn't fathom a being that would take someone who had done so much good as Lily had and not even try to step in when it saw Lily was faced with the person who terrified her. That it would just let her be dragged into the darkness. My choice, Lily gasped, mine, doesn't make it right. Consequences. James nodded, cause and effect. She fell silent again, and he bent his head over her hand. He had been right in saying that her window wasn't open, but not by much. But he had time, just a little time, to decide. I don't really know what to say about that last story. I guess... <laughs> I really thought it was the soul, in a sense. Or it does at least for me. I would really love to know more as to what happened next. Did James save her? Or what? <laughs> you know? Did he become the new compassionate death? How was he judged at the end? Did he end up in hell? Oh god, I want to know. Why leave it so open? It's torturous. However, that is the end of the short story segment to today's episode of The Cursed Kingdom. I hope you enjoyed it, and now let us go for a break, where we'll be listening to One Kingdom, Melbourne's hottest new heavy rock band, which is set to release their second EP in late September, titled Science of Change. The new EP is expected to expand on the band's earlier music, bringing fans more of the driving, inspiring tracks they have come to crave. So, I hope you enjoy! And just one quick reminder before we do delve into their song, Affiance, 
just a quick reminder, if you enjoyed that short story segment and look forward to watching more of The Cursed Kingdom, don't forget to press that subscribe button and that little bell so that you get notifications. And also, don't forget to like and comment as well, because I need to know what scares you the most. So now let's just delve into Affiance by One Kingdom. Before we continue into our last segment of today's episode, I'd like to give a quick reminder that if you like the content, then don't forget to press that subscribe button and the bell button so that you receive notifications about all of our future content. And press that like button. Our goal is to reach 10 likes in this episode, so that would be great if we could. So, like in our last episode of The Cursed Kingdom, this week we're going to be looking at Reddit forums. After all, Halloween will soon be upon us, and sometimes the scarier, the better, as it approaches. So, let's take a look at r slash let's not meet. Starting with, he drew cartoonish pictures of me dying. Okay, so I used to work at an apartment complex where this guy lived. He was eccentric, funny, well-read, and we had a casual friendship going on. One day, he came in and left everyone in the office handwritten notes. He also left me a book, knowing that I liked to read. 
everything seemed fine until about a week later, I found a note from him on my car windshield. It was a rambling thing on what was about a two foot long piece of paper, but nothing too concerning. The next day, there were two more notes on my windshield. The following day, two more. At this point, some of these letters were starting to get sexual, so I showed them all to my manager. We agreed that something needed to be done, and my manager said he would speak with him. Well, a few days pass, and my manager still hasn't spoken with him, and he is constantly leaving two to four letters on my car every day. I'd had no contact with him since he started writing me. Finally, on a day that he knew I wasn't working, he came by the office, told my manager that he was going to leave something in my office. My manager saw that he was carrying a book, but when he came into my office, there were hand-drawn pictures taped up in my office. In every single one of them, I was dead and he was depicted running away with my two cats. The next day, manager called him into his office and told him that he was no longer allowed to contact me and that if I wanted to contact him, that I would. That did not stop him from coming by to try and talk to me multiple times when he knew my manager was out of the office. Shortly after, I transferred to a completely different complex for multiple reasons and thankfully have not heard from him since. Well, I've got to say that one was pretty creepy, but as with everything we read and hear on the internet, take everything with a mountainous pinch of salt. So now on to the next story. The man who wanted to photograph 12-year-old me. I was born in the early 90s and grew up with a computer in the home, making me more familiar with computers than my parents and giving me a lot of opportunity to get myself in trouble. At 12, I had a MySpace, a Life Journal, a profile on One Model Place, a website where aspiring models and photographers could connect. My photos weren't provocative, but Obviously, there were a lot of creeps on the site looking for young girls like me who wanted attention. This one man, we'll call him Beaver, messaged me consistently to tell me how beautiful I was and that he'd love to photograph me. He tried to arrange a meetup, I think at one point offering to fly out to me for a photo shoot. I'd never actually intended to meet up with anyone on the site. I may have made a stupid choice by putting my photos on the internet, but I wasn't that naive. I ignored him, but he continued to message me for years, eventually finding me on MySpace and later Facebook. I blocked him and moved on, assuming that would do it. Fast forward 16 years, I'm 28 years old, it's 2019 and I get a message on Instagram which doesn't have my last name anywhere. It's Beaver telling me how beautiful I still am and that I've clearly turned into a sophisticated young woman and asking me if I'm still modelling and interested in meeting up for a photo shoot. I have no idea how he found me why he was looking for me, and why he even remembers me almost two decades later, but it's really unsettling. I blocked Beaver on Instagram, but now I think this may be a stalker situation and don't know how to proceed. So Beaver, no, I don't want to do a photo shoot. Please give up. Let's not meet. Wow, that certainly does sound like a stalker situation. And as someone who's actually had a stalker, which maybe one day I'll share with you guys, who knows? I can kind of say it is like the creepiest thing ever to have happened to you. Or at least one of the creepiest things to ever have happened to you. And by the way, I do apologize if you can hear my dog snoring. He is fast asleep right behind me, so... 
The next Reddit story we will be indulging in today is he had his eight-year-old son approach me. This one time, I went to a bagel shop. I was sitting at a table alone, minding my own business, when a kid with his dad waved at me. The dad had to be in his 50s, maybe older. The kid said hello, which already was odd, considering I live in a major city, known for having some of the unfriendliest residents in the US. Once he had managed to initiate contact, the dad smiled at me and said, You're very pretty. You should be an actress. You look like a movie star. Mind you, I have always been baby-faced and even look a bit younger than my age now. 33? I was 15 at the time and looked about 13. I smiled shyly in response but said nothing and stared at my food. Right before they were leaving, the eight-year-old kid walked over to me with a handwritten folded note. He said, hey, don't open this until later, and scurried out with his dad. Inside the note was his dad's email address, phone number, and a note reminding me that I was pretty and to contact him. Had I even been of a legal age, this was still horrifying considering he put his son up to it, and even worse, that he was teaching his son the values of being a predator. So, nasty, hebophile, pedophile dude at the bagel shop, let's not meet. And I hope you've instead met someone who will put an end to your horrible endeavours. Bloody hell. Now, I always look at Reddit stories and stay rather sceptical while I'm reading them. But still, I like to believe that they're real. I don't know. But this one, this last one we've just read, I really hope was faked because that is scary. Or the very scary to me. I don't know about you guys, but that is a very scary scenario for me. Like knowing a guy is using his son to try and pick women up and teaching him predatory, like, ugh. So our final story from r slash let's not meet is guy in the empty home let's not meet this story is from when i was a teenager and just started high school my friends and i lived in a town that at the time had a lot of farmland near my house a mall had recently been made so my friends and i tried to ride our bikes to go shopping one day we missed our turn and instead wound up on a long road with a small downhill slope that ran through some farmland. Having never been to the mall before and never having been down this road, we assumed it would lead us to the mall. Instead, this road twisted and turned through thicker and thicker woodland after the farmland ended. At the road, there was an abandoned old house that was visibly falling apart. My friends and I simply turned around and found our way to the mall that day. But we ended up coming back time and time again because the road was long and had just enough of a slope to make your bike go faster than you could pedal. One day, we ended up daring each other to go into the house. Up until this point, we had never gone into that house. My friends dared me to go in because I was pretty confident it would be safe if I was careful, so I did. It was a pretty empty house with some old mouldy furniture. There were holes in a lot of the floor space. One Halloween's Eve, we went back to the house to play hide and seek in the house for shits and gigs. We brought a few of our other friends and it was going to be a pretty fun time. So we thought. At first, everything went all right. We played a few rounds and some of the girls were sneaking away with their boyfriends off in the woods to make out. But we kept playing. Eventually, 
I went into the building to hide again and noticed that while there was a ladder up to the attic, there was a hole I could climb through that led to a more secluded spot of the attic where I couldn't be seen as easily. I thought to myself, this is the perfect hiding spot and climbed right on up. I had brought a flashlight, so I turned it on, but kept the light low to the floor to not give away my position outside. I started looking around when I noticed a flash. It was the reflection from a pair of Nike shoes. Someone was already up here. I raised the light to see who else was already up here, but it wasn't one of my friends. He was dressed in torn up clothing. I only held the light over him for half a second before noping the fuck out of the attic. It took me about three seconds to squeeze back through the hole, but the guy stood still, not even acknowledging that I had ever been near him. I told my friends and we all decided to stop playing and go outside to look at the attic. Part of it was exposed by a hole in the side of the roof and there was a window that the guy was standing near. Nobody could see him through the hole, so we went to look at the window. We saw a guy with a crazed look in his eyes, and we just bolted. One of us told their parents, and they called the police. The police did not find the person. However, what they did find makes me glad I got out as soon as I did. The police found seven fingers, with three being the right index finger and a decapitated human head mounted on the windowsill of the attic. We weren't looking at the guy I had seen. We were looking at a corpse. Apparently, that house was being used by a gang and it was so out of the way and unimportant that nobody ever went to it aside from us. What's more... They found a machete on a tarp where I had seen the guy and several traps inside the house meant to catch intruders if they tried to sneak into the attic through the ladder. So, guy in the empty house, let's not meet. TLDR, played around in an abandoned house, turned out to be a gang's hideout with body parts strewn about. That last one certainly was dark and creepy. However, I'm going to remain really sceptical with it because, I don't know, it just doesn't fully ring true. But it would be kind of creepy and a bit scary to think that it could be true. So, I know I've only done two Reddit segments and I just want to know if you guys enjoy the Reddit segments. Um, If you do, please do comment them in the comment section down below. It would be lovely to hear your thoughts on what I feature in every episode. And if you do have a suggestion of a subreddit for me to go through and maybe narrate some of the stories from, do comment them. I'd love to hear your feedback and your thoughts as to what I can add and use to expand this lovely podcast. I mean, come on, it is kind of saving me from the brink of insanity caused by this damn curse, after all. So help a girl out here, will you? Just a little... So now let's listen to a bit of John DeCroft, a Christian rock musician who may just surprise you. We'll see.